Hello, everyone, and welcome to this ISAP webinar titled Symbiotics, Definitions, Characterization, and Assessment. My name is Mary Ellen Sanders, and I serve as the Executive Science Officer for the International Scientific Association for Probiotics and Prebiotics. ISAP is a nonprofit organization dedicated to advancing the science of probiotics, prebiotics, and related substances. I would now like to introduce Dr. Karen Scott from the Rowett Institute at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. Karen, can you tell us what the goal of this webinar is? Morning or afternoon, everyone. Uh, the goal of this webinar is to explore the concept of symbiotics in some detail and to address your questions about the ISAP consensus paper. The implications of complementary and synergistic symbiotics are not necessarily apparent to all, including what types of clinical trials and characterization are needed for proper use of the term. Thank you, Karen. And today we're fortunate to have two excellent speakers. We have Professor Kelly Swanson and Professor Bob Hutkins. Both are board members of ISAP and both were authors on the ISAP consensus panel paper on symbiotics. And Professor Swanson um, chaired that panel. Now, before we introduce our first speaker, I wanna just cover a couple of housekeeping items. First of all, this session is being recorded and that's so that people who can't join us live will be able to see it. And we will have this posted on the ISAP website within a few days. Our speakers are each going to speak about 20 minutes and we will have about 15 minutes for um, questions and answers following. Please submit your questions in writing via the Q&A function um, at any time throughout the presentations. Um, all questions will be asked in writing and answered verbally. And please note that your registration link for this webinar cannot be shared. Okay. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Kelly Swanson. He's the Kraft Heinz Company Endowed Professor in Human Nutrition in the Department of Animal Science and Division of Nutritional Sciences at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Kelly, over to you. All right, thank you, Karen. I think hopefully everyone can see my slides, and so I'll get started here. Before uh, we get into the content, I guess there, there is uh, just uh, one disclosure slide I want to I provide. And um, on the grants and contracts side, I, I have some federal funding that really isn't not related to this topic, but certainly on the, on the industry funding side, I have several human and, and pet food companies that sponsor, sponsor work in my laboratory, and, and much of that is in the, I'll just say, the biotic space. So depending on every study is a little bit different there. Um, on the consulting and advisory roles, in addition to serving uh, on the board of directors for ISAP, I do also serve on a couple of committees uh, for the Institute for Advancement of Food Nutrition Sciences, or IFINS. This is formerly the ILSI North America group, uh, but I serve as a scientific uh, leadership council, uh, a member of that committee, as well as the gut microbiome committee. Um, and then on the advisory side, uh, for uh, you know, I, I serve uh, for many uh, human and pet food companies, and some of that has, has nothing to do with the biotic space, and, and some of it does. So I just want to want to say that before we get going. Um, as a brief outline for my, my slides, as well as uh, Bob's, is I'm going to give really, I think, a, a foundation and the background of, of symbiotics, go over the consensus panel and the updated definition, and then a few main conclusions and things that are often confused, and then some guiding principles. And then Bob's really going to, I think, have more of an applied talk where he can get more specific into the criteria, the strategies, and different examples that are, that are out there. So we all know that, you know, the importance of the gut microbiota and uh, not only on the gastrointestinal health of the host, but just overall host health. And so there's many uh, strategies to modulate the gut microbes. And so one of those is through live microorganisms. And so those that are working in the human and companion animal space probably call them probiotics. On the, in the livestock area, it's usually referred to as direct fed microbials, but the concept is the same. You're providing live microorganisms to, to, uh, to modulate the gut microbes. Um, another strategy that's pretty common, again, is non-digestible dietary substrates. So dietary fibers and prebiotics are the two kind of main categories there. And so we'll go into more detail there. Uh, of course, there's other strategies like fecal microbial transplants for certain disease populations. Still a lot of work needs to be done there. Um, and then other combination treatments might be, might be available. But really, when you, when you think about it, the probiotic and prebiotic strategy are, are a couple of the key factors and strategies to modulate gut microbiota. 
So on the screen here, you can just see the sheer, the popular, uh, popularity of these just by looking at how many papers have been published. And so this was out of PubMed. I just did this a couple days ago. And you can see, I, I took it from 1995 when, when Glenn Gibson coined the term prebiotic. And you can kind of see probiotic and prebiotic um, study has, has rapidly increased over the past decade, but certainly it's been growing uh, over, over that period of time. The term symbiotic is, is, is definitely uh, way down on the list, but it, the popularity and the activity in this area, uh, it continues to increase quite a bit. And so I gave a talk like this just a couple of years ago and the citation uh, levels you know, have increased in every ca single category. And so um, there's a lot of research out there. One of the key problems or uh, struggles is keeping up with the research, right? All the microbiome work, probiotics, prebiotics, symbiotics, it's very difficult to, to really interpret all of that and apply it. And so what's really nice is that ISAP has a lot of different infographics. And so the, the, the link for the website is, is, is at the bottom of the slide here. But if you just go to the ISAP website and look at infographic or, or Google that, that term, um, a lot of infographics will come on. And it's really, really useful, uh, these infographics, to really take in a really complicated topic and, and really drilling it down to what is the definition, how do we use the definition, what are the criteria and things like that. So I'd really instruct or advise people to go look at those infographics. Um, what happens over time, certainly we need to have updates. And so there are scientific advances, especially in the microbiome field over the past um, decade or couple decades now. So the methods by which we can assess uh, you know, the, the, the probiotic and prebiotic efficacy on the host um, and, and uh, many other things uh, are, are quite different. They keep evolving over time. And so uh, scientific advances are, need to be considered in the, when we think about these definitions. Also, there's a lot of confusion and misuse. And so that's really why we're here today is to kind of clarify things in addition to publishing the papers, uh, what are these terms and, and how do we use them? So to start with really uh, on these, these consensus panels that ISAP uh, sponsored and put together, they started with probiotics, not surprisingly, um, given their popularity and a lot of uh, probably confusion in that area. And in 2014, they published a paper and you can see the definition here that they're live microorganisms that when administered in adequate amounts confer a health benefit on the host. And so once that was done, uh, there was a prebiotic consensus panel. And so I served on this panel with Mary Ellen, with Karen, with Bob, and it was really led by Glenn Gibson, not, not surprisingly, the person that coined the term, uh, you know, 25 years ago or so. And so we, we updated that term to, to be a substrate that is selectively utilized by host microorganisms conferring a health benefit. And so once those were done, and I served on this, this panel, and uh, we were talking a little bit, and I guess Mary Ellen and and, and Glenn kind of recruited me, I guess, to be the chair of that panel, but it was really the, 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 the thought was, well, we've, we've kind of updated the probiotic, uh, the, the definition, the same with prebiotics. We probably should target symbiotic. And the initial uh, definition of symbiotic was a probiotic plus a prebiotic, which Glenn Gibson, again, in that 1995 paper, had symbiotic in there. And so we kind of thought, well, give, given all that's changed in the last couple of decades, we should probably consider symbiotic as well. And so, in addition to myself, we recruited this. Uh, you, you can see all the you can see the picture of the of the of the panel, all the names and, and and where they're coming from there. But we had a really nice balance of of nutrition, gastrointestinal physiology, microbiology expertise. So we really uh, had a world you know world leaders in these areas and really worked together as a team. And so we met in in May of 2019 uh, before the ISAP meeting there in, in Antwerp, Belgium. And so that's where we we we, we had about a, a day and a, and a dinner before that. Um, to, to really do the work and, and to get much of the work done. Um, the main objectives really were to clarify to all the stakeholders the, a scientifically valid, a valid approach for using the symbiotic term. So what, what um, not just picking uh, you know, words out of the air, but what, based on the science, what, how should we uh, define what a symbiotic is and then the criteria for, for the judging what, what can be a symbiotic and what cannot be. Um, and then communicating that again by a position paper in the Nature Reviews uh, Journal of Gastroenter uh, Gastroenterology and Hepatology. And so a lot of most of those consensus papers are, are published there. And so they're open access, they're highly visible. And so um, they're really, uh, I think, well-respected um, papers when they come out. So the overall process was, uh, you know, um, we met in May of 2019, but really uh, late in, in 2018, we, we assembled the panel and we had some emails going back and forth so people could work on uh, you know, their topic area. So when we met in person, we could really be the most efficient with our time. And so every panel member had a, a presentation and a certain topic. We had discussions. And so by the end of the day, and it was, it was, a, it was a long day, but it, it was a good day. We had really good discussions. Um, we had a publication outline. 
everyone had assignments to go back home and then, and then turn things in within uh, just a couple months. We had everything back in July. Um, we compiled that, and I say we, it was really myself, uh, Bob, Mary, Ellen, and Glenn at the, at the first, very first stage, putting everything together and trying to smooth kind of everything out. Everyone writes a little bit differently, and uh, we had to make sure all the pieces were, were kind of in place. We did some revisions, sent it out to the committee. Um, after a couple of revisions there, we, we got to the point where we could share it to the, the ISAP Board of Directors. Once they kind of looked at it and had a couple of small comments, we submitted it for review. I went through the peer review process like like any any paper, um, and then it, it came out um, with with COVID. Uh, you know, in, in 2020, it kind of set back the editorial process a couple months, but it did come out in in August of 2020, and the final paper uh, then in November of 2020. Um, it's open access. Here's the link if you want to. If, if I'm not sure if we're sharing these slides or not, but uh, you can, if if you if nothing else, you can say send by a consensus panel, and it'll it'll come right up. The paper will come right up. Um, you know, it, it's been accessed over 28,000 times. It's been cited a couple hundred times right now. And, and so it's, it's you know, I think, highly visible and it's been well received. Uh, the rest of the, the, my slides here, I'm going to kind of go over the, 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 this publication and take out some of the key points, updating the, def, you know, what is the updated definition, some things on characterization. Uh, Bob's really going to touch on some of the, some of the evidence or examples of the evidence that's out there, but some of the guiding principles and then some implications. So that's really uh, kind of the rest of the the rest of the talk here. So our updated definition is a mixture comprising live microorganisms and substrates selectively utilized by host microorganisms that confers a health benefit on the host. So a lot of the same terminology that we had from the probiotic and the prebiotic um, uh, definitions, but it doesn't just say a probiotic and a prebiotic. And I'll get to that point in just one slide, but there's one topic that seems to trump everything. And so that's the confusion between symbiotic and symbiotic. And I wanted to address that right away because it even our computers get confused, our autocorrect will often change symbiotic to symbiotic. And we had that even on our consensus panel of things being sent back and forth. And it's just, unless you're on top of it and accept that word into your dictionary, it's, it's, getting, it's getting changed all the time. So symbiotic, if you, if you think about syn, syn stands for together. It doesn't mean synergy, and it certainly doesn't mean what's below here in symbiotic. So synergy, again, you have a live microorganism, you have a substrate that are, that are together. That's all that the, the, the syn really means there. The symbiotic, in, in contrast to that, it refers to an ecological uh, relationship of one organism living in a long-term relationship with another organism in their natural ecosystem. So that could be a host microbe interaction, but I've had other, uh, given other examples here that you can see whether it's mammals, fish, reptiles, whatever, insects, whatever it might be, there are symbi symbioses that exist, uh, but that is very different than symbiotic. So that term should not be, certainly should not be used in this context. So I wanna, I wanna clarify that first. Another thing, it, it, the question that comes up, well, why isn't it just a, a probiotic and a prebiotic put together? And in many, in many cases, that is the case. And so, um, it, but it, we don't want, we, we thought it wasn't necessary for that to be the case for in, in all cases. Um, there might be some microorganisms, there might be some substrates that maybe cannot function and provide a health benefit on their own, but in combination they can. And so that combination really fits the Fits, we thought fits the definition then of providing a health benefit to the host. And so that, that, that will fit. And so we think that gives people flexibility. When you think about innovation and, and moving forward, that, that will allow uh, people to, to go right to a symbiotic if they would like to, without having to prove a probiotic and a prebiotic before they take that next step. And so certainly there should be a strategy. There should be, you know, it, it should be based on science, not just guessing, uh, but, but that will, will should leave, <clears throat> excuse me, some room for innovation there. Also, there might be some combinations that are functional at a lower dose. And I know Bob's gonna to touch on the dose issue. It's still very important to prove that the dosage of the combination provides that health benefit, but they could be different than a probiotic, a prebiotic on its own and in a combination in the symbiotic. So there, there are some flexibility there. <clears throat> because we don't say just say a probiotic and a prebiotic, there really are two types of symbiotics then, the complementary and the synergistic symbiotic. And so this is again, taking text and it figures out of uh, one of those infographics that is on the symbiotic and there's a there's an updated version now on the website it was just updated a couple months ago um, but really if we look at the the right side of, of the screen here this is a complementary uh, a symbiotic and this is probably what most people think about you have the mixture of, of the probiotic that's already been established uh, uh, something that's already established as a prebiotic and they can kind of function independently to provide a health benefit and they can be the same health benefit or they could be different health benefits um, but each, in each case, you can see that the, the, the probiotic will result in a health benefit 
the prebiotic by being utilized selectively by the host microorganisms will also provide a health benefit. And so um, in this case, they must be tested. Still, this combination must be tested in the target host demonstrating the health benefit. But that utilization, that selective utilization does not need to be demonstrated in that study because it's already been demonstrated uh, in its uh, definition as a, as a prebiotic. And so in that case, you don't have to show that. The synergistic uh, symbiotic is, is a little bit different. So again, here, Again, we're not saying probiotic and prebiotic, we're saying a live microbe and a substrate. And in this case, uh, in the figure, the, the solid lines here on the right side, um, this must happen. So the substrate must be utilized by the co-administered live microbe and there must be, that must uh, re uh, result in a health benefit. The dotted line here on the, on, the, on the lower side, the substrate might also be, and it probably is often, also utilized by the host microbiota and that might also help result in a in, in health benefit. But certainly in this, in this case, again, they must be tested together in the target host. But in this study, this study must demonstrate both selective utilization and the health benefit. So those are a couple of key differences between the synergistic and complementary uh, symbiotics. When it comes to characterization, of course, this is where uh, characterization and the criteria for evaluating uh, you know, efficacy and everything has really changed the last a couple decades with all the advancements in molecular biology and sequencing, really the standard is now, if you have a live micro, microorganism, uh, you, should, you should have the genome sequenced, it should be annotated, it should be placed into a, a database where people, other people can, can, can look into it and research it. Um, using, of course, the, the taxonomic nomenclature that's current at the time, this continues to change over time, but it's, it's good to be current. And so we know really what microorganism you're talking about, what family does it live in, where, where is it? And of course, by the genome sequence, you can then look at potentially, are there genes that uh, might, might lead to efficacy and a health benefit? Are there genes that maybe uh, will, will affect safety or something else? And so given all this information, the safety, identity, you know, the, the purity should be you know, uh, uh, defined as well. The potency, all of that can be, can be studied. When it comes to the substrate, really, the two things that are the most important is the structure of the, of, of the substrate as, as well as the purity. If you know the structure, uh, with all that we know about the microbiota, and I know that keeps expanding all the time, but if you know the structure that's there, you should be able to predict what microorganisms can utilize that and maybe have a selective advantage and could, could, be, could serve as a nice combination. And that really uh, should, should be used in that way. <clears throat> Purity is also very important. There are a lot of uh, substrates out there that might be 90 to 95% pure, while others might be 50% uh, pure, even less than that. So um, if, you're, if you're taking a, a a substrate of some kind of prebiotic or a symbiotic, if that's five grams, of that five grams, how much is carrier, how much is active component? And so that really should be uh, defined as well. That's very important. Um, and then of course, when it comes to stability, if you have a live micro microorganism or a probiotic, you have a prebiotic, um, in their, on their own, you, you, can, you can set up uh, whatever conditions, if it's whatever format, a lot of them are dry, but there could be you know, some liquid or, or some, something else. Um, uh, separately and individually, it might be rather easy to, to keep them stable. Combining them together, you also need to really make sure that that stability and that viability is going to be there a long term. So regardless of the format. So that's, that's really important as well. A couple other points here. Certainly the gut gets the focus most of the time, but we just want to, in, in the paper, we do say whether it's the oral cavity, the skin, whether it's the vaginal tract, whatever it might be, there are several targets that can be used for symbiotics. So it's not only uh, applied, the term doesn't only apply to the gut. And so, so that's an important point. Another one is that's very important when it comes to the research that's done, um, the press releases and the media that goes around it, and just the marketing of a product, you need to really have the, the, the host species in, in mind. And so I took a picture here that I, I, I found where kind of have, we have a few species here that we have humans, uh, companion animals, and depending on where you live and what, how you think about horses, oftentimes the, in, in in our department here, the horses in the companion animal side, it could be on the livestock side, depending on where you are. But I, we have cattle, sheep, and pigs. Regardless of what you're talking about, you really need to think about who am I uh, trying to benefit here? Um, and what, what's, the, what's the combination of the microbe and, and, the, and the substrate? Um, the dosage, all of those are gonna be very important and probably different uh, for, for any of uh, the target species. In addition to that, if we look at the bottom of the slide, now, in addition to the species, the age and the life stage, is this an infant, a young growing animal versus maybe a geriatric person or animal, um, the health status, sex, all of these factors uh, come, in, come into play. And so 
all of them are important, not only in the research, but also how the research is applied to, to practice. And so that all those things need to be thought of very carefully uh, as, as you go forward. So really there's a lot of guiding principles in this area. The paper goes through a lot of things. These are just the, the high points here, but really, again, you need to start with a strong study design and you need to know, am I gonna try to prove that this is a synergistic relationship or it's complementary? What, what are my outcomes? Does that allow me to have a crossover design or do we need to do a parallel design? How long is the intervention period? All of those things are very, very important before you before you begin anything actually working. You need to really do your, your homework and see what's most appropriate. Just as important as the population. So again, I just kind of touched on all this on the previous slide, but that, that's very important. Um, of course, when it comes to publication, describing the intervention so others will really know what is the dosage, what is the specific information uh, about the, the microorganism, the substrate that, that's being used and being tested. Um, of course, the importance of having placebo and controls there that to really compare to. Um, when it comes to the outcomes, just as important as those up above, the design, the population, what are you going to measure? What is proving a health benefit? Um, if you have microbiota on its own, um, you, it's very difficult to make any, any um, conclusions about that. You really need some very important and well-accepted health outcomes. Um, of course, proper statistical analysis, documenting safety. This is The safety component was one thing that the panel really, when we, we discussed this and we, we went back home and we kind of, several of us looked at what research is out there, a lot of people either aren't measuring safety outcomes or they're not reporting it. And so we really say, you know, suggest to follow the consort guidelines. So at least that information is out there. If it's not being reported, just no one knows how safe or how, how not safe that it is. And then lastly, uh, context is very important. Similar to what I said in the previous couple slides here, what target population was studied, what were the outcomes, and how can you use those outcomes to, to relay a message to, to all the stakeholders. And so whether it's press releases, uh, publications, it should be accurate, of course, as, as all research should be, accurate communication of the findings, the characteristics of the symbiotic, the health conditions, and the population studied are all very specific. And so, you know, the results can't be applied to everybody. It has to be specific to the population uh, and the conditions that are, that are, um, that are, that are stated and what were, what were studied. And then from a stakeholder perspective, we have guidelines and some suggestions here all the way from regulator uh, down to consumer. And so this is my last slide. I will stop sharing and we can move on to Bob and I'd be happy uh, to take any questions at the end here. That's excellent. That's great. Thank you very much, Kelly. That was a really enlightening talk and I'm sure that's generated lots of questions. So if people want to start loading their questions up into the Q&A, then that would be perfect. But before we actually get to answering the questions, I would like to introduce Professor Bob Hutkins. So he's the Kem Shahani Professor of Food Science in the Department of Food Science and Technology at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. And Bob's going to continue the discussion on symbiotics. Over to you, Bob, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, thank you, Kelly, for the great in, uh, uh, introductory slides to kind of set the stage for what I'm gonna talk about. I also have some disclosures to note. Um, I also have grants and uh, consulting with companies that sell and use probiotics and prebiotics. And I am, am a, a founding partner and owner of a uh, startup company called Symbiotic Health. So what I intend to do in, in my 20 or so minutes is to uh, provide a, a, a critical revisiting of the consensus paper that Kelly just described. Um, and uh, looking at the, at, again, re revisiting the criteria, the challenges, the strategies. I'm going to show a lot of examples, representative examples in the marketplace, in clinical trials, and I'm going to wrap up with um, the science of developing symbiotics, which was alluded to in the, in the consensus paper, but um, I, I, I think I'm going to be able to contribute a few more uh, personal thoughts on that when we get to that point. So I just want to remind everybody, I think Kelly had a slide on this as well, that the reason why we're, we're in this field, um, the goal of these gut health products is to improve host health via the microbiome. But I think most of us recognize that doing this is not easy. And that's because the gut microbiome is stable, it's very individual, and it's very resistant to change. Therefore, it's it's difficult for 
any microbe, transient microbes, but that would include beneficial microbes to influence the microbiome. So this resistance is a good thing in the case of a potential pathogen, but also puts a barrier for beneficial microbes to, uh, to gain entry and uh, access to the microbiome. So how do we enrich for beneficial microbiomes, uh, beneficial microbes in the gut? They can be consumed regularly at high doses. That's one of the principles for the probiotics. We can provide those beneficial strains a competitive advantage. That's the principle of a prebiotic, or we do both. That's the principle of a symbiotic. And I like this quote from, from my colleague Jens Walter and Rio Maldonado, the ability of a probiotic strain to persist when specific niche defining resources are available reinforces the potential of the symbiotic concept. So it puts an ecological um, uh, uh, twist to, the, to this definition. So <laughs> I would contend that formulating symbiotic supplements is more than just one from column A and one from column B. Um, and this is how most symbiotics, at least in the supplement shelf, have been formulated. And so we end up with this situation. The problem when you formulate symbiotics in supplements, or one of the challenges, is that the doses are far less than are, need, than, than are needed to be effective. So again, I'm not picking on any particular product because um, it's, it's so uniformly observed in, in, the, in the category, is that you see 200 milligrams, 60 milligrams, 25 milligrams of prebiotic. Now, I'm not even commenting on the strains, but uh, let's, we'll, we'll, we'll make the assumption that the strains qualify, um, as Kelly just pointed out, that, they're, that they've been sequenced, that they're proven to be probiotic. But just look at these extremely low doses for prebiotics, far less than needed to be effective. Some products do contain higher doses, um, two and a half, two grams, um, but even that is stretching it. And then there's a, a number of products that, that don't even state how much of that prebiotic is in there. So it's very questionable, I would say, that these can be effective. So the challenge for symbiotic supplements are multiple. So how to squeeze enough prebiotic into a capsule? Even the large capsules only accommodate maybe a gram. And the effective doses are at least three, sometimes five, sometimes 10 grams for some prebiotics. So this is a challenge. Um, there, are all, there are other ways to deliver the, the prebiotic in a symbiotic formulation, straw, sachets, gummies, um, and then there's food and beverages. And so you'll see foods and beverages. And I should also point out, I, I was remiss in, in not saying this before, some products don't even use the word symbiotic. They'll just say pro plus pre. So I want to make that point. Um, but nonetheless, in foods, you'll see more of the prebiotic component, up to three grams, but not even always. So sometimes you see less, again, sometimes you don't see any dose stated for the prebiotic component. So what has been the rationale for symbiotic pairing in clinical trials? So I've kind of um, made the point that there hasn't been much rationale in supplements, but what, what about for clinical trials? So I would consider a, a, a reasonable rationale is that if the, um, if the probiotic or the prebiotic has been used in a previous clinical trial with efficacy, that's a reasonable rationale, or even preclinical animal or in vitro data would provide, a, I think, a reasonable rationale for using that symbiotic in a clinical trial. Unfortunately, for many clinical studies, and I've read through perhaps a hundred or more um, reports in, in the clinical trial literature, there just isn't one stated. And that makes it really hard to infer any kind of causality in the absence of a rationale. Okay, and we'll talk about synergistic symbiotics in a few minutes. It's especially true for that category. So again, to repeat what, what Kelly had just um, described in the symbiotic consensus paper, what makes a symbiotic synergistic? 
The substrate is selectively utilized by the microbe and the measured health be benefit is greater than the estimated effects of each component separately. And I would add, these are my own personal um, views, that there's some additional distinctions. Um, one would be that the responder rate is increased, um, meaning that there are more, that the, that the net health benefit effect doesn't change, but there are more responders, um, positive responders. And the other, and I'm gonna, get to, I'm gonna show us a, a, a couple of slides later on, um, is that, that I would also contend that synergistic symbiotics could be observed just by virtue of greater persistence or greater biological activity um, uh, enhanced by the combination. And I'll come back to that later. Okay, so now I'm going to take a critical look at some of the examples of symbiotics in clinical studies in the literature. And I wanna start with perhaps the best symbiotic success story to date. And that's this well-known uh, Panaki um, Panagria study um, uh, with the symbiotic, um, the effect of a symbiotic on reducing sepsis in, um, in infants in, in India. And in this case, they, they had, it was a well-designed study, large number of subjects, two arm with an with a, uh, L plantarum. The 150 milligrams of FOS looks like a low dose, but don't forget these are infants. So on a per kilogram basis, it's a reasonable dose. The strain had a rationale because they had done previous studies based on its ability to colonize, block adherence, but there was no scientific rationale for using the prebiotic. It wasn't even demonstrated that the strain could grow on the prebiotic. There's another study. Um, Kelly pointed out that some symbiotics are used for cosmetic purposes or topical purposes, I should say. And this is one where they um, using a symbiotic for uh, melasma, which is a kind of a facial blemish. Here's the study design, two arm, um, a symbiotic with six strains plus FOS, but again, no scientific rationale, no strain information, and no FOS dose. So even though it was effective, you're left with uh, that question of causality, what caused the, the benefit. Another symbiotic study with, no with an effect, but no rationale, it was a symbiotic looking where the primary outcome is um, um, ILs related to gingivitis. Um, There's really a, a two-arm two, uh, two study, but smokers and non-smokers. And again, six microbes, but 239 milligrams of FOS. I don't think that's sufficient. Um, and again, no rationale, no strain information. Um, this is an interesting study. Um, where they talk about a synergistic effect, but in this case, they, they use the definition of synergism um, a little bit differently than I think that for sure differently than we had intended in the paper. In this case, combining inulin with a LKCI probiotic gave a, uh, improved the viability of the strain during the production and drying. So they call this a synergistic effect. I don't think that this is at all what the consensus paper would, would say qualifies as synergism. And here's another really nice study in a nice journal. It was a three-arm study, probiotic, symbiotic, and control, well-known well strain, a good dose of prebiotic, no rationale stated, but they had um, a positive effect. The problem is, as Kelly pointed out, they used SYM, so nice design, positive outcome, but not very good editing. <clears throat> so now I want to talk about um, where the, some, some papers where there where there has been a rational state a rationale stated in the paper, um, and so I really want to applaud these uh, a handful of some really nice studies. These are the synergy studies done in Australia, and they come right out and explain the rationale for selecting the strain um, and for selecting the prebiotic that facilitates, in this case a combination of prebiotics that facilitates um, utilization throughout the entire colon. Um, so a series of nice studies with a rationale stated. Um, it's another study um, on, 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 uh, on infants. Um, 
And it was like a three-arm study, again, control prebiotic plus a symbiotic plus a reference group. And again, the rationale here is based on previous preclinical and clinical trials. Um, so again, um, some of these papers do come right out and say what their rationale is. Um, another example, um, this is a um, work done um, by um, some colleagues in, in Belgium and in the UK. Um, and again, they went, went again, it's BB12 plus eight grams of FOS. And they went to, they specifically um, state their rationale, symbiotic chosen to maximize beneficial effects. Strain was chosen based on specific beneficial effects that had been previously shown. FOS chosen to specifically stimulate growth and activity of BB12 and improve its survival in the host. So again, um, a clear rationale, um, I think justifies the, the, just, justifies the use of the symbiotic and provides a basis for demonstrating causality. One of the main goals of the ICEP statement um, that, that Kelly did talk about was this, this notion of innovation. And so this is a quote from the paper. The proposed definition of a symbiotic should encourage innovation in formulations by not requiring that component parts meet the strict definitions of either probiotic or prebiotic. That's why we say the microbe and the substrate. So I want to give you some examples of how I think these um, some very innovative approaches for developing symbiotics. Uh, Kelly did talk about um, pet foods, and he didn't show fish, but, um, but symbiotics, probiotics, prebiotics, and symbiotics have been used in fish. And so this is a, um, a recent paper from a journal that I normally don't subscribe to, Fish and Shellfish Immunology. But um, it was done, it was a great study. It's a forearm study. So for showing synergistic symbiotics, I think that's what you need is a forearm study. It turns out that this is a, the, that the microbe is probably not a known pre probiotic, Pediococcus acidi lactase, and the, and the substrate is not a known prebiotic. It's, it's a pistachio, um, whole pistachio polysaccharide. Yet, uh, and the target um, is tilapia fish that is um, um, sensitive to infection with Aeromonas hydrophila, a pathogen for fish. And what they found is this is probability of survival of the fish after it's after a exposure to the pathogen, and the symbiotic worked better than either the substrate, the control, or the microbe itself. So a synergistic symbiotic for disease resistance in fish. Um, cool study. Um, there's another um, study. This is uh, again I think would qualify as a microbe plus a substrate. So in this case, it's a, a, a um, five-strain cocktail of Acromensia, two Clostridia, anaerobic butyricum, plus a B infantis, um, plus inulin. I didn't, could not find the dose in any of the papers from these studies, um, but they did have a positive outcome, improved um, postprandial glucose control in participants with type two diabetes. So, um, and they provide a rationale that actually the, the increase in butyrate production from the fiber is beneficial. I have a couple more examples, um, a really cool example here. Again, something that we might not think of in, in the gut world. This is an oral symbiotic. And um, in this case, the, the microbe of interest is a lactobacillus rhamnosus GG but the substrate is not even um, a carbohydrate or, or a polysaccharide, um, it's arginine. And what happens here is that the microbe utilizes the arginine, produces ammonia that's inhibitory to the karyogenic strep mutans. So I think this is a really cool application of a, making a symbiotic in a very unconventional way. So um, I'm getting near the end. I just want to have a few more slides. Um, so for synergistic symbiotics, and I think Kelly alluded to this, there are some special challenges. The microbe of interest must selectively utilize the substrate. Um, 
I would infer from that that the microbe of interest must occupy other residents for that substrate. The microbe of interest must be enriched. You must be able to show that in the study. Um, and multi-arm clinical trials would ordinarily be expected. So this is a, a high bar for a synergistic symbiotic and expensive to do forearm studies. So preclinical studies, I think, can be very useful for formulating and providing a rationale for those symbiotic pairs. And um, in my lab, we've developed a couple of these platforms. One's called in vivo selection, in, vivo, in vitro enrichment. And the whole idea here is to feed a prebiotic or a substrate to either an individual or to fecal samples um, and select for those strains that outcompete all of the others in that either in the human or in a fermenter for that substrate and then repair them and reconfirm that they um, that those symbiotics become established in um, in humans. So you still have to do it and then you ultimately you still have to do an RCT for a health benefit. Another cool approach has been to has been it was called a gene trait matchmaking where again they do this in vitro but they look at the phenotypes, the genotypes and confirm that the strain of interest is able to consume and ferment the, pro, the prebiotic or the substrate of interest. And then again, you still have to, at the end of the day, still do uh, a human RCT. And then I think um, this is my last um, slide. Um, another way to think of symbiotics, again, I mentioned this before, is enhancing bioactivity. So this is a, um, um, a review paper um, on polyphenols as substrates for symbiotics. And they, they outline how they do it. It's basically an in vitro approach. But here's another way of thinking about symbiotics is in this case, the polyphenol is um, biotransformed by the microbe. It's sort of utilized, but it's not even uh, much of a growth substrate, but the polyphenol becomes more active more bioactive by virtue of a step that the micro performs. So uh, in real life, this could be elagic acid being converted by the microbe to urolithin, which are known to be biologically active and provide health benefits. So I think this is a really cool approach. And I should point out that um, the use of polyphenols as prebiotics um, will be the subject of a, um, another um, ISAP uh, webinar. I think that's in April. And I'm sure that um, uh, they could put that information in, in the chat. So I think um, that is my last slide. And I think well, it's now time, I think, for questions. Thank you, Bob. Um, we're gonna go to gallery view so we can see all of, see both of our speakers and, and Karen as well. And um, thank you so much for the people who have submitted questions so far. Um, just as a reminder, please submit your questions in the Q&A function, not the chat function, um, and we will um, go through those in the remaining time. Okay, so do I just shoot off with the first question then? So sure. thank you for the questions that have already appeared, and I guess we'll do them in some sort of order, although clearly if questions come in that are too similar to previous questions, then we we'll move on to the next valid question that's not been um, used before. So the first question, which is one that probably neither of you will might want to answer, but it's been asked. So um, we we'll go to Kelly first and then Bob, but the question is, can you name a commercially available, scientifically validated, true symbiotic product in the current marketplace, especially maybe ones containing GOSS? I don't know what the reason for the question is, but, um, I don't know. <laughs> that one, I'm not sure if I can, that was pretty specific too. I'm not sure if I can um, give, give a product off the top of my head. I'd have to look at that. I'm not sure, Bob, I know um, he, he maybe he has an idea of it, but um, I do know when we were looking at what's out there, certainly most of them I think are on the complementary uh, symbiotic side of it, but um, Bob, I'm not sure if you have one, especially with Goss uh, containing, but um, well, they've been formulated and they're out there, um, but I can't say that, that um, well, let me, I, I do have a, a conflict of interest on, on this question, so uh, I hesitate to say too much about it, but, um, but it's, a, it's a good point that um, 
that there, there are few and far between. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. I think we should move on anyway. So okay, I guess you well, just have to look at the products. <laughs> um, there was one question about reproducibility of research, and, and I think that this is an, an interesting point. Um, and, you know, what is your opinion about, um, you know, how many studies need to be conducted? Is, is one well done study sufficient to provide adequate proof of a symbiotic um, health effect. Um, Bob, do you want to try that one? Well, Mary Allen and I have had had discussions on this because when we, in all the definitions for pro, pre, and sin, we don't attach a number to how many studies need to be um, uh, dem to, to demonstrate a health benefit. Um, I would definitely say more than one. Um, and The, you know, the, every, every study, even if you repeat a study, it's different subjects, it's different conditions, but um, I'd like to, in, in my view, I'd, I'd say a few with that particular strain and that particular um, substrate, several, but I'll let, I'll let Kelly comment, Mary Allen, you could comment as well. I was going to say I, more of my experience, and I, not that I know what FDA and other regulators are thinking all the time, but I know my experience is in that area. And certainly um, there's different, again, different claims you can make. And I know if, if, it, if you say clinically shown, of course, you have to have at least one study with RCT of some kind in the target species. If you go to clinically proven, then they say, yeah, you better have two studies or more. And that's, I think, in the pet side. I don't want to say it's a written rule, but I think it's kind of, that's what a lot of people go by. And I think it, the same would kind of apply to people. I think that um, one study, it's, it's great to have and good to show, but it, it gives you a lot more confidence if you can repeat that. And then at some level, of course, um, looking at some of these, if there would be enough studies to do a systematic review or something gives you more confidence, but it's, it's difficult with all the potential combinations. And we've talked about this on the you know, the consensus panel as well, that it's really difficult to kind of put them all together. It's one thing if it's just inulin or it's, you know, a certain strain, but with the combinations, it's really difficult. Thank you. Um, okay, so the next question focuses on the dosage. So I think both of you mentioned this in your talks, but and, and the, the question makes the point that the dosage is really important. But the question is, what about thinking about these as supplemental sources of prebiotic fibre, meaning that the diet needs to contain a certain amount of the prebiotic in order for there to be an effect? So do you want to comment on that? Uh, maybe Kelly first this time and then Bob? Okay, sure. I guess on, you know, on the research side, we always think about that and what, what population are you studying? And um, oftentimes, if you have people, I mean, very few people meet the, the dietary fiber recommendation that they're supposed to consume every every day anyway. But certainly if you have someone that has a really high consumption of fiber or prebiotics, getting an additional benefit, it is difficult, I think, to show. So you'd certainly, the, those that would, I think, uh, benefit the most would be those that are not eating that in their regular diet. So I guess that would be the point there. On, on the research side, we always try to consider that of if someone's eating an extremely high amount of fiber, that they're probably not um, very useful to be on the study because they're already getting all of that. So um, I guess that's what I would say to that to that point. But certainly, you can't ignore the basal intake that a person has, you know, from their from their diet. Okay. So, yeah. Bob, do you want to comment on that as well? Because I think you mentioned responders in your talk as well. Yeah. So I'm I have not seen literature, any literature, to suggest that those doses of less than a gram or so that you're seeing in so many of those supplements. Um, will have any effect on the microbiota. Um, and as Kelly pointed out, if you combine that with an with individual that's consuming 10 or 15 grams of, of dietary fiber, an extra couple hundred milligrams, I can't see doing much. Um, so yeah, most of the, if, if the, the studies that have, where they've tried to find a minimum dose for common prebiotics like inulin or FOS or GOS, um, five grams is often, you know, I think in the, in this prebiotic paper, I think we put three, gram, three grams, but there's not even that many examples of three grams doing much. So can I follow up on that though? Because if you have a synergistic symbiotic, then the fiber that's been, the, 
the substrate that's been administered with the probiotic, if it enhances growth of the live bacterium in that symbiotic, then is that not enough if it has an enhanced health benefit? And I would agree with that in theory, um, in theory, but don't forget that prebiotic, it, it, it depends how specific that prebiotic is for the, or that substrate is for the microbe, because it's, it's, it's available for everybody that's down there. Um, so it's, you know, the race is to the swift or the race is to the, whoever can most efficiently um, capture and consume that particular substrate. So, um, it could be a winner, um, but not, it's not necessarily the case. That's why you have to do, that's why you have, to, I think those in vitro, um, uh, the preclinical studies can be very informative to show you that at least that strain has the physiological wherewithal to outcompete everybody else. I think it leads into um, another question that was asked about whether or not either of you could advise on a robust bioinformatics method, for example, carbohydrate utilization related genes um, for matching pro and prebiotics for potential um, synergistic act activity. Are there platforms out there that, that you know of? <laughs> um, so the, the, the group in the Netherlands has that gene, gene trait matching uh, or gene um, phenotype matching strategy. And I think I like that a lot. Um, and we do similar things in, in my lab to, um, to try to come up with these perfect matches. Um, and there could be even, you could even do re reverse, I don't know, I wouldn't call it reverse genetics, but reverse strain selection by um, screening a bunch of different substrates, fiber substrates, and finding microbes that are responsive to those substrates and then going back and, and, and matching them that way. Mm -hmm. So like an unknown substrate that's very specific for enriching for a particular microbe. That's another clever way to go about it. Right, I, I do think that, that the future is going to, to see the development of, of these non-carbohydrate um, prebiotic type substances, right, that do have this type of specific specificity. I think that was the, um, I don't, I can't say that we were thinking entirely along those lines when the symbiotic panel met, but we kind of evolved to that thinking. And that's why we went to that yep. word of substrate and not prebiotic or not right. fiber or not right. non-digestible oligosaccharide for that very reason. Right. right. So there's, there's quite an interesting question here about to what extent should we consider upper gut digestion before testing the functionality of symbiotics in the colon? I think this is a really interesting point. So I wonder if one of you wants to comment on this. Maybe Kelly first this time. <laughs> yes, I was, I was gonna throw it to Bob, but um, I'm not sure if I have a great, uh, great answer to that. Um, when I saw that come in, I know the focus is, you know, most when you're measuring microbial activity, I think that the focus is largely on the colon and the hindgut. It's really difficult, maybe again, preclinical, um, models or in vitro can, can try to get to that a little bit. I think it's really difficult in vivo to really distinguish what's going on, you know, in, in the small gastric area and small intestine versus the, the large intestine. So it is, um, I think that you'd have to, to kind of get at that question, you'd have to use a, a few different strategies to get at it. So um, we can't ignore it certainly, um, but it would be difficult to, to test the functionality. I don't know, Bob, what you think on that one. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I, the, what goes on in the, in the upper GI tract is um, not anything that we study in my group, but, um, but I, I even pointed out an example of, 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 of uh, formulating a symbiotic that in theory would be effective, at least within the colon from, from one end to the other. Um, and so I th at least people are thinking about that, but, um, but it's a good question and, and I don't have an answer. I guess it probably depends a little bit on the combination that you're using. Because as you say, you had that lovely example of dental caries that was very effective, the, the combination. And I suppose if you're trying to target um, activity in the large intestine, some of those prebiotics are known not to be digestible by human gut enzymes. So they would, in theory, survive till the colon anyway. So, okay, thank you. 
and I don't know the literature on this, but um, you know there are there are um, prebiotics and probiotics and symbiotics for Helicobacter and others. Um, not a lot of studies, but again, people are thinking outside of just the, the gut per se. Which is good. And here's a, a very specific question about, can I use the symbiotic term on a product containing a probiotic and a prebiotic, but not tested together? So Kelly, do you want to address that? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we, we discuss that quite a bit and we get that, that question, I think, quite a bit. I know, Mary Ellen, I'm sure you do too. I guess we thought as a panel that even if you have a um, you know, confirmed probiotic and a confirmed prebiotic, you still, just to make sure there's no antagonism and to make sure, again, from a dosage perspective, it is effective, they should be, they should be tested together um, and don't just assume that everything's okay, even if, even if the others have been, you know, they've been, again, kind of met the criteria for a probiotic and prebiotic on, the, on their own. Right, and, and I think um, the other component of that is that we, we did say for a synergistic symbiotic, you have to have a study that shows both the health endpoint and the microbiota um, endpoints, but for a known prebiotic, when you test those together, you really, as long as you do the health endpoint, that is a sufficient um, testing. You don't have to re-demonstrate the, the selective utilization of that substrate. Um, uh, yeah, uh, at that point, yeah, it's the health outcome, yep. I'm looking over at the uh, chat. I just want to um, go back to the previous question about the number of studies, and Han, you made a great chat comment. Mary Ellen, you may, you may want to point that out. Yeah, you know, there have been several comments that have come in about, about the clinical trials, and, and one question that we started with was, well, how many is enough? And I, I don't think anyone's able to answer that question. I think that you need to have a study that provides some level of convincing result that you would expect, have a reasonable expectation that the relationship that you demonstrated in this study was was real and that would be reproducible. And and if and and I think that what Hanya pointed out was that of course the way the, the study is designed, the way it's powered, whether or not it is a high quality study, so that you have confidence in the results. Um, any issues like that are really critical to how much confidence you have in the outcome of that study. Um, and, and there were some other comments. Bob, was that a sufficient yeah. response? Yeah. Um, th there were some other questions about, well, how long do you have to conduct your study? You know, what's the duration? Um, what types of outcomes would be the ones that you might target for a symbiotic? And I think it's very difficult from my point of view to give um, general answers to those <laughs> types of questions in terms of duration and outcome. And to me, it relates back to Bob's point, which is you have to have a rationale. And if you have a rationale, then the rationale of your product design is going to drive what types of outcomes and what type of duration you're going to need for demonstration. Do, you know, like the, um, I, I, one other comment I want to make, just a general comment, um, whether it's a complementary or a synergistic symbiotic, the reality, and this is my view, the reality is that um, to show a beneficial effect of a putative probiotic, because it's not a probiotic until it shows a health benefit, but of a, it's a high bar to, show, to show, have a, a well-done clinical study to show a health benefit. And to then make that, take that strain and make it into a symbiotic, whether it's complementary or synergistic, but to expect a higher level of health benefit. Mm -hmm. That's really asking a lot. And as I pointed out before, you know, your gut's stable. It's hard to hard to, to mediate much of a change. So to, it's you, you're happy if you have a probiotic that works, but to get it to, you know, to put it on turbocharge, that's asking an awful lot. But that's the goal of a symbiotic. Well, Bob, boy, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we actually required that. So, well, for a synergistic symbiotic, you need to have greater than the, the effect has to be greater than the individual component. That's right. Oh, okay, okay, all right. I right. guess that, well, that leads on to quite a nice question that somebody asked about the microbiome itself, because as, as you just mentioned, Bob, the microbiome is very stable. And Inga's, uh, somebody's asking, meant, saying that you, Kelly mentioned different ways of changing the microbiome, but you didn't mention diet. And they're wondering what you think the state of the art is there. 
That's a great question. That's that's what um, keeps us fairly busy here. We, you know, oftentimes we're we're focused on specific. Maybe it is a prebiotic or a, a potential prebiotic or a dietary fiber. But lately, in the in, at least in the pet space, um, there are not just your kibble diets. There's the canned diets. Now there's human grade diets and all the formats. What I can say is they're all, and we, we try to look at the ingredients and you know what what's actually being consumed and what actually you think is digested and reaching the, the hindgut, but they are very different. Um, and so most of the, I'll say on the pet side, almost all of the literature is on with animals eating extruded kibble foods. You start feeding them other diet formats, the microbiome profile looks completely different. And so um, th that's one thing that, you know, it, it just diet alone certainly has a huge impact of where you start. And it was kind of, I think, uh, Lee's, uh, question early on too of that basal you know intake of fiber and, and prebiotics and other you know live microorganisms what is that and where where are you starting and so yeah the diet just alone it, it has a huge impact and so what we haven't studied in our lab is if you started with all these diets and then you have you know let's take a prebiotic or or, or something where where does it move then from that point because they're they're all starting at a different place really and so and they do bounce back if you um you know, the extreme thing in, in pets is feeding a raw diet, and those are becoming more common and not recommended by most veterinarians, uh, just given the pathogen load that usually comes with those. But dogs and cats can, can tolerate those fairly well, but then they, again, they're starting at a different point. And so the efficacy or potential protection of a symbiotic, I would guess, would be better there if, if you have a higher maybe risk than, than some other diet format. So yeah, diet is very important. I'm not sure if there's a gold standard <laughs> I would just say they're they're all very different, and if you apply that to people, I mean that's where you, you doing research on this. You talk about responders, non-responders. There's so many factors involved. It, it's really complicated to try to have a a well conducted study where you you can control some of those uh, areas of variability because it's it, it's really challenging with um, and you can instruct people that you know avoid certain foods, but still even then um, if you have several you know. I guess you're maybe maybe my generation. If you don't cook a lot, it's for, you know, maybe you're eating things that aren't that that different. But from different cultures in our population here on campus, um, if people are cooking their own food, it's gonna be very very different. So I'm not sure Bob or Mary Ellen if you want to make a comment there too. But it's it's all over the board. <clears throat> yeah, no, I, I think the diet complicates all of these studies um, quite a bit, and um, but it's the reality when these products get released and sold. That, you know, there's going to be a mixed diet that they um, that they have to interact with. So um, yeah, that's just part of the the challenge, I think. Well, I think we're out of time now, um, so I think we have to wrap this webinar up. Thank you so much, Bob and Kelly, for your great talks and for fielding all these questions and. Karen for hosting um, along with me for this. Um, I really do appreciate the audience participation. We had a really great group of people and good questions were submitted. So thank you very much to everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you.